time to record. Okay, Erev Tov, we are here at Kilach Yifte Yisrael Renana on Zoom, and uh, we're studying, uh, we're reviewing for Pesach. I opened up my notes from last year, and uh, what I put in the, the message right at the beginning was uh, a refuah shleima for the father of uh, our, our dear member, Sarah Kay. And as we know, Sarah Kay's father uh, passed away soon after. And uh, so first of all, let's dedicate this Li'ilui Nishmato and Li'ilui Nishmat, all those who passed away, uh, extended members, friends or family members uh, from our community and, uh, and beyond. But we also uh, feel very blessed that uh, look how far we've come from a year ago. Uh, the miracle of this whole vaccine campaign here in Israel is really outstanding. And we have a lot to be, to be thankful for. We have truly emerged from Galut to uh, Tegu'ula. And this is how I want to start. I want to mention a custom of Rav, uh, Don Yitzchak of Abravanel, as well as a custom that was uh, quoted in the name of uh, Rav Eliezer Rokeach of Verms, both a Sephardi and Ashkenazi rabbi, that they say, Chayav adam mitzrayim, that we have to make ourselves appear like we exited from Egypt, that we were redeemed from Egypt. And that means that we need to include the stories of our own lives in the telling of Yitziat Mitzrayim, anything that happens to the Jewish people. After Yitziat Mitzrayim is part of this story of redemption. And I would add that the newest chapter that we need to include in the story is COVID. You know, and please, God, Bezrat Hashem, it's all behind us. And one day we're going to be sitting at the Seder Pesach with our, with our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandchildren telling them what happened, what happened during this period of, uh, in world history and how we got through it. And it was bookended by, uh, for the first Pesach, when we were all in Bidu during Seger, and bookended by second Pesach, when we were finally able to be with family and be together as a community and daven together and sing halal together. And uh, so please, God, we should only be moving in, in, in positive you know, territory. And uh, so we have to daven, we have to continue to daven, but also be thankful, give hoda'a, that we have arrived at this, uh, at this place. So that's, that's the derech, derech trush. Now, I want to break this down into three different parts this evening. Number one is to discuss Erev Pesach, Shechal B'Shabbat. This year, Pesach is going to fall on Motzei Shabbat. The last time this happened was 13 years ago. So uh, we have to review some of the halachot. What happens when Lel HaSeder falls out on Motzei Shabbat? That's the first topic we're going to study. And once you know those halachot, you can prepare appropriately for uh, how much to cook and when you're going to, if you can put on the soup and what you're going to do. That's topic number one. Topic number two, where we're going to talk quickly about kitniot on Pesach here in Israel, which is a very confusing topic for people, uh, especially for us, Elim, who came from Chutz Laretz. Uh, Chutz Laretz is, Ash uh, there's an Ashkenazi monopoly on kitniot and in Eretz Yisrael, it's a Sephardi monopoly on kitniot And so we have to learn how to adjust to this reality and what that means. And number three is we're gonna talk about kashering and cleaning our kitchens. Pesach is not sp uh, spring cleaning. We're gonna talk about what you need to do so you can do it effectively and properly, al pi, uh, al -pi halacha. So let's start with Erev Pesach that falls on Shabbat. I'm gonna share this on the screen. Okay, this is a source sheet, uh, not a source sheet, it's a, uh, it's a sheet, a summary that you all received in your emails today. And uh, so let's run through this quickly. So that everybody knows what's on here, and then we can, um, and then we can uh, move on to the next topic. So let's start first of all with uh, the first of the the firstborn fast. Tanit Becharot is going to be on Thursday, March twenty fifth. So we're moving it forward a few days. We don't fast on Shabbat. We don't fast on Friday before Shabbat. So we fast on the Thursday. We will have a siyum after seven thirty shacharit. And guess what? We're going to do the siyum on Masachet Pesachim, which is being finished in the Daf Yomi cycle right at this time. Pretty, pretty cool. On Friday, March 26th, between Thursday and Friday, we're changing the clocks from 2 a.m. springing forward to 3 a.m. So just be aware of this change. On Friday morning, we still burn our chametz on Friday morning. The latest time to do that is 11.32. In theory, you could do it later, but we try to do the same thing we do every year, which is to burn the chametz before the sixth hour. There will be dumpsters throughout Ranana for you to uh, for you to do this. And then candle lighting is at 6.36 on, uh, on Friday night. Um, I should also add here, add in right here, that you do, uh, you know, Bidika Chametz is done on uh, Thursday the 25th, okay? So uh, 
after after uh, nightfall. Uh, and now on Shabbat, we're going to talk about what these times are. So the first of the fast for uh, first of the fast of the firstborn, we've already told said move is moved to the thirty Thursday. When do we get rid of the chametz? Now normally we perform the tikkun chametz the night before Pesach. So we should we should in theory do it on Friday night, but we're not going to look for Pesach on Thursday night on Friday night. We're going to move it forward to Thursday night. After Bidika, we still recite Bitol Chameitz, Kol Chamir Bachamea Diika Birshuti. So we search for Chameitz and we mentally, Bitul Chameitz is when we mentally get rid of Chameitz. We do both of those things on Thursday night. And then Friday morning, we burn the uh, we burn the Chameitz just like every year. There will be locations that are not designated to burn Chameitz. Now, now we get into Shabbat. What do you do for Shabbat? Because it's confusing because you want to be ready for Pesach because Pesach is starting on Motzei Shabbat. At the same time, you have to have bread for challah. So what are your what are your options? And you don't want to have bread all over the house. So you know, the key thing is to is to really already be eating Pesach food on Shabbat. That's the ideal. All your food should be cooked on uh, you know Pesach dishes, Pesach food, except for for chalot or four rolls that you have for Friday night dinner and for Shabbat morning, because you need two loaves of bread at each. You need shtelech, and you need, uh, you know, for Shabbat morning. Um, now, why don't you use matzah instead? So the truth is you're not allowed to eat matzah at this point, because we want to eat matzah for the first time at Lel HaSeder, Bitei Avon. We want to, we want to, you know, enjoy and get, say, you know, pleasure from eating the matzah. And if you're already eating it on Friday night and, and, and the morning of uh, before Pesach, it's not going to be so special. So everything should be cooked in, uh, you know, in, in Pesach kosher uh, dishes. And uh, on Friday night, you make a moti on the two chalot. Now, if you have space to eat in another location, you have a mir pesen, you have a garden, eat, you know, make a moti there and eat your bread there. And then you move or you change the tablecloth and then you move to the other space, or you change the tablecloth and you eat the rest of your meal, which again is going to be food that is already made ready for, uh, for Pesach. Because the point is that you don't want to get your... You know, your your the all the crumbs from the challah mixed in with uh, with your Pesach food and all the dishes. So you just want to keep them a little bit separate. But you could have some salatim with the bread. You could have some fish if you want, and uh, etc. Now Shabbat morning, we're going to start tefillah really early in the morning. We have to do it really early early in the morning so that everybody can get home and eat their first that Shabbat. And you have to eat your first Suda Shabbat. I mean, because you have to have you want to have bread. So the latest time to eat chametz is 10, 18 a.m. So you want to have your bread ready by that uh, by that time. So we're going to dive in early in the morning. This officially is Shabbat Hagadol. So we'll recite the special Haftarah, the Arvad Hashem in Chat Yehuda, which ends with Hine Anochi Shalech Lachemet Aliyan Avili Pnei Bo Yom Hashem Hagadol Vahanora Liyahu appears at the Seder. He is uh, he is always associated with uh, with redemption. And the renewal of the brit, the covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people. This is why he comes to a brit milah. This is why he joins us at the Lela Seder, which is a renewal of the brit that was forged with Adi Avot, and then also in uh, during Yitziat Mitzrayim. So this is the this is the haftarah for Shabbat Hagadol. Shabbat lunch, same protocol as Friday night. You have your two chalot set aside. You eat it on a different tablecloth or on the uh, you know on the side in a different uh, slightly different location. And after the meal, you have to get rid of all the remaining chametz. So you don't want to have a lot of chametz at this point. If there's a non-Jew floating around, you give him your chametz. But you don't want to have to run after a non-Jew. And it's hard to find a non-Jew here in, uh, here in Ranana. So the crumbs, you flush down the toilet. You, uh, you know, throw out to the road in the wind. You know, and, uh, and you, recite, uh, you recite bitul chametz again. Okay? Now, um, sorry, let me just take this off. And at this point, you know, you'd want to brush your teeth. In general, when you brush your teeth on Shabbat, you need to make sure you don't cause your teeth to bleed. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, some people also are careful to use uh, liquid uh, toothpaste. So, uh, okay, but you brush your teeth, you get the, the, chametz, uh, the chametz out. Now we get to Sudash Lishi, which is the third meal. Now the third meal has some restrictions as well, because you, you, they're not, not like we're really like boxed in. Why are we boxed in? You can't have bread because... It's already after the fourth hour, so you can't eat bread. You can't have matzah because you, uh, we don't eat matzahs too close to Pesach. You also don't want to eat too much so that you're hungry for Lel there. So what are you going to eat at the end? And you have to finish this meal before the beginning of the 10th hour. Okay, So you have to eat it. And I think I put the time in here on the top. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't put it down here. It's about 4, I think it was like 4.15 or something. 
um, uh, here, I have it right here, uh, about 4.30 p.m. You want to have this, this meal. Now, so what do you eat at Sudash Lashit? So Svaradin are able to eat matzah ashira. Matzah ashira is enriched matzah in which they use fruit juice instead of water. There are different versions of it. You eat this for Sudash Lashit. Because you cannot use matzah ashira for Svaradin, then not, Amlal has said there to fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah. So therefore, you can, you can use it uh, during, uh, during this time for a Sudash Lashit. And Svaradin generally eat matzah ashira throughout Pesach if they want to. It's a little bit sweeter. It has some fruit juice in it. Tastes a little bit more like a, like a cracker, although there are some concerns about how it's made here in Israel, so some are machmer about this. But that is one option for Sfaradin. For Ashkenazim, who do not eat enriched matzah, their option is as follows. They could eat, uh, this is one of the options for Sudash Lishit, which is also mentioned in Hochot Shabbat. You could eat fruit, fish, or meat for, for Sudash Lishit. Um, you obviously, you could have vegetables, but that's what you should have. This is quoted in the Ramah in Siman Taf Mem Dalet. Um, so Sudash Lishit also should be eaten after davening Mincha and before the 10th hour of the day, which is about, I, I think it's about 4.30, 4.30 p.m. I will adjust this if I need to. Um, now, this is in terms of what you could eat. I should just mention there are some other options that are a little bit more creative. And, um, you know, I'll just go down to the bottom. So first of all, can I eat kidney on Shabbat before Pesach begins? Yes, until the fourth hour, the same for chametz, which is 10, 18 a.m. Um, and what if I want to get rid of all my chametz before Shabbat? What are my other options? So the truth is you do have two other options. One is to use cooked matzah. The other one is to use fried matzah, okay? Cooked matzah is matzah that's, you know, regularly baked matzah, and then you put it into your soup, okay? And you, you make it really wet. Now, it's got to stay the same shape. You still need the, the torita de nahama. You need the shape of the matzah. Um, and, um, and what you do is you can make hamotzi on this, you could say brachat on this as well, and because it's cooked, it doesn't have the same taste as regularly baked matzah, so it's not a problem of interfering with the taste of matzah on the night of Lama Seder. Alternatively, you could fry your matzah, and it's the same thing, and then you could also use it for all three meals on, uh, on Shabbat. Uh, and matzah shir, of course, is an option for uh, Sfaradim, but not for uh, but for, not for uh, Sfarad, uh, not for Ashkenazim. Although for the first two meals, Ashkenazim can use matzah shira. Okay, but then you have to kovei asu that you have to make it into a meal because it sort of like has a cracker status. It has a status called kataba bekisnim, and you have to eat a lot of it in order to make it a uh, into a suuda. So this is a third option. It's all on the sheet here, and this is in your email from uh, from today. Now, a few more things. Preparing from Shabbat to Yom Tov. And right after we finish this section, I'll take questions, anything that's uh, written into the, into the chat. So write in your questions if you have one. How about preparing for the Lel HaSeder? It's important that all the preparations for Lel HaSeder be done before Shabbat. The Haroset, the Maror, the Zroah. Do this all beforehand. If you did not do it before Shabbat, you're not allowed to do it on Shabbat because you can't prepare on Shabbat for Yom Tov. Everything we do on Shabbat has to be Shabbat focused. We're not thinking about other things beyond. We only focus on Shabbat. So you cannot prepare these things before Shabbat. One is to wait until Shabbat is over to do any preparation for the Seder. And this is not recommended because it will cause you to start your Seder later. And this includes a number of things, by the way. You can't set the table for the Lela Seder until Shabbat is over. You obviously cannot light candles. A woman says, Baruch HaMavil Ben Kodesh L'chol, lights candles after 7.33 p.m. when Shabbat is over. Uh, one shouldn't take fridge uh, out from the, you know, food out from the fridge or put food onto the blech until Shabbat is over. You know, uh, if you're taking out something for Shabbat, you can leave it out. But you really shouldn't be thinking about Yom Tov or doing things in preparation for Yom Tov. Women can light candles after 7.33 p.m. and remember to have a Yurtzite candle or some other candle available so that you can light from an existing candle. Uh, finally, Tfilan Motzei Shabbat. Uh, we don't say atachon antana, which is what we normally add into the Amidah and Motzei Shabbat. We add in vatodienu. Vatodienu is about separating between the Kedusha, the holiness of Shabbat, and sanctity, uh, excuse me, of Yom Tov, Shabbat and Yom Tov. These are two different forms of Kedusha, okay? Uh, but, you know, both, both significant in their own way. And of course, we recite Hallel after the Amidah in Shul, on, uh, and this will be on Motzei Shabbat, and we come home for Lel HaSeder. Someone did ask me today, and I don't have an answer yet, can you start Ma'ariv 
on Motzei Shabbat a little bit earlier before 7.33 p.m.? I got to look into it. I don't have, a, I don't have an answer to that question yet. Um, and this way you could try to start the Seder a little bit, a little bit earlier. Um, obviously, you can't start any, you can't do any preparation before Shabbat is over, but maybe it would give you a few minutes. You're already home by that point. I will get back to you about that, that question. Um, one more thing that, uh, that should, one should be aware of is that uh, one, you know, Shabbat Minuchah, people I'm sure will take a nap on Shabbat in order to enjoy the spirit of Shabbat. And my, one might be a little bit more arrested on Kamlel uh, Haseder, so an extra 10 minutes won't make much of a difference. Um, I should also mention, Kiddush at Lel Haseder is unique. Kiddush is a combination of Kiddush and Havdalah. It's called Yak Nehaz. Yak Nehaz, uh, it stands for Yain, or make the bracha on wine, uh, then Kiddush, then Ner, okay? And you can make the bracha on a Ner, that's like candles that you lit for Shabbat, uh, for Yom Tov. Havdala, and then Shehachianu. What's missing? What's missing is Bissamim. Why do we have Bissamim on Motzei Shabbat? We have Bissamim on Motzei Shabbat because we're, we're bereft, we're grieving that we're losing the Neshamayi Teira, the extra spirit on Shabbat. However, here we have Yom Tov, we're going to Yom Tov. So we're not losing anything. We're in fact gaining Simchat Yom Tov. So we don't have to say the Bracha and the, uh, the Bissamim. Okay, this is the, this is the, um, the first topic. Uh, does anybody have any questions on this particular topic about Erev Pesach, Shechal B'Shabbat? Any questions? Uh, you could write them into the chat. You could write them to me privately or into the chat. So I'm going to take questions about this right now. I should mention that, uh, that it is a little bit confusing when Erev Pesach is on, uh, on Shabbat. And not only might we be a little bit confused, but even the, the, the rabbis in the time of Hillel Hazakain were confused. They didn't know whether you could bring a Korban Pesach when you Dalad, when the 14th of Nisan falls on, on Shabbat. And they go to Hillel and Hillel gives them an answer. And he says, oh, it's just like the Korban Tamid, just like the daily offering in the Ben Amikdash can be brought on Shabbat. And that is Doche Shabbat. So too the Korban Pesach is Doche Shabbat. And it's based on this answer that Hillel Hazakain becomes the Nasi. And he rises to become the leading uh, rabbinic figure in Eretz Yisrael right around the turn of the, uh, the millennium. So, uh, so if you're confused, don't worry. Even the colleagues, even the rabbis in the time of Hillel Hazakain were confused. And, um, and okay, question from uh, Rashi Rosenzweig. On this specific Shabbat, would it be okay just not to have bread? So the answer is yes and no. Yes, you do not have to have bread on the Shabbat, okay? But you still have to have you still have to have, you know, some hamotzi, some food that you could make hamotzi on for Shabbat. So as I mentioned, you have a few options. You have three options for Ashkenazim. Number one, to use matzah that you put into soup. So you have your, you have your soup, you put the matzah into the soup and you make hamotzi and become mazon on that matzah. Number two is you fry your matzah, not in butter. I don't recommend frying it in butter. You can fry it in olive oil and it takes away the taste of the matzah and therefore you could use it for all three meals. The third option is to use matzah ashira, enriched matzah for the first meal, enriched matzah for the second meal, and then sudash ashit, fish, meat, vegetables, fruit, whatever it is. Okay, so that's the answer. And that's at the bottom of the sheet that I shared with you, which is in your email. You received the email with all of these halachic resources today from Shifram. I sent it out this morning, so everybody has that. Any other questions about this topic? Otherwise, we're going to move on to Kibneo. Topic number two. Let's move on to kidney oat. Now, with regards to kidney oat, I have, um, I'm sharing with you a document right now that I have sent out to the, uh, also, this is also in your email, okay? Kidney oat guidelines for shift day for 2021. If I had to sum up our view on kidney oat, it's as follows, okay? The prohibition of kidney oat is still in force. It exists today. Uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter that you move to Israel and there are other Jews who don't keep kidney oat. We keep kidney oat. However, however, kidney oat does not have to be more restrictive than the laws of chametz itself. Okay, so kidney oat is in force. You're not allowed to eat kidney oat, but, but one can be lenient about certain ways that kidney oat get combined or created, and one can be lenient in those areas. Okay, so, so the stringency exists but there's a more lenient reading of the stringency. I hope that's clear. So one cannot say, oh, well, my, I, my son married a girl who's Svaradi and therefore we don't keep kidney out anymore. 
there's no halachic basis for that uh, for that argument or that type of uh, you know mindset. Kenyot is enforced, but as we'll talk about, certain products which are only le'ochle kenyot, even Ashkenazim who are following halacha properly and not even kenyot can eat these products. Let me explain. And this view is a perspective put forth by Rav Cook and many other achronim as well. But Rav Cook is one who writes about this very uh, very forcefully. So um, we see here on this on this sheet here, the two page sheet, practical guidelines. These are the following species are considered kidney oil, rice, alfalfa, peas, millet, sorghum. Uh, if you know what all these things are, you should uh, you should win a prize. Someone asked about cumin today. Cumin is one of the uh, the products that is uh, cumin right there. A uh, vetch. I don't know anyone who puts vetch into their food, but if you do, it's kidney oil. You should just be aware. Um, there are certain things that, now, how do you define kidney oat? Rav Moshe Feinstein says, we only define kidney oat as something that was part of the original gzera in the time that it was created, in the 13th century in Ashkenaz. There were certain foods that didn't exist in Europe at this time are not included, okay? For example, uh, uh, potatoes. Potatoes were not in Europe in the 13th century, and therefore, even though potato flour looks like wheat flour, and you could confuse them, Nonetheless, we eat potatoes on, uh, on uh, Pesach and Baruch Hashem, because if we didn't have potato, potatoes, I don't know what we would eat on, on Pesach. Peanuts is another example. Unless you have a Chumrah, uh, a specific family minag, not to eat peanuts, you could have, uh, you could have peanuts. Soy, okay, soy. Rav Dovli are based, and it, and by extension, of this view of Moshe Fines, and it says soy did not exist in Europe. Soybeans did not exist in Europe uh, at the time when the Xera was made. And therefore, uh, you know, soy and, and soybeans are, uh, are not an issue of uh, kidney oat. And, you know, the example he gives, he says, if someone's allergic, uh, you know, to, to regular milk and eat soy milk, okay, so you could drink soy milk. I'm not saying that someone should run and, and you know, eat all the kidney oat they can in the world, you know, in these cases, just because, you know, there's, there are some leniencies here, but if, if there's a need, if there's a need, then one, uh, then one can. Um, other examples, quinoa is an example, the OU Paskind, that uh, this is a new world grain and one can have quinoa on Pesach, um, string beans and fava beans. You see Rav Delvira rules that string beans and fava beans and their pods are kosher for Pesach, since in this state they are considered vegetables and not kidney oats. Um, now, this is one leniency that things that were not part of the original decree in the 13th century are, uh, are permitted today. Number two, is oils derived from kidney oat? And this is a point that Rav Cook uh, made, that if you create oils, take sesame, uh, Rav Cook was arguing about sesame oil, Sesame oil was created, uh, you know, they, they had a new form of production in which it did not come in contact with water. So if it doesn't come in contact with water, what's the problem with it? Are you allowed to have a, a, a wheat grain that, that doesn't come in contact with water? Yes, yes, you're even allowed to have wheat that comes in contact with water. It's called matzah. You just can't bake for more than 18 minutes. So if you can manage to extract oil from kidney oats, and this is called, a, is essentially a derivative of kidney oats, and you can do it without it coming in contact with water, it's fine. And examples of this are canola oil, cottonseed oil, soya oil, and, um, and corn oil. I'm just taking out something here, which doesn't make sense. And corn oil is, is we say, is not permitted because it is often produced by soaking the corn in, uh, in water. Okay, so these oils, which are derived from kidney oat, are also uh, permitted because, again, they're not part of the original gzera. It's the kidney oat themselves and not the derivation of these kidney oat. And as long as they're produced, without coming into contact with water, this is uh, not a problem. Now, now we get to um, other things. Now, many of the products on the shelves, the chocolate bars and the, many of the sweets, they say, you know, the ochle kidneyot bilvat. These are only for people who are allowed to eat kidneyot, okay? So is one allowed to eat these products? Now, and many of them have uh, something called, uh, you know, uh, liftit, okay? Lysitin, which is uh, lichitin, which is an emulsifier, which is one small ingredient in, a, you know, 20 ingredients in a chocolate bar. Now, there are a number of reasons why these products are permitted, okay? Number one, these are put into the chocolate bars before Pesach. And before Pesach, even, even chametz is, is beheter, okay? So certainly kinyot are beheter. And there's no taste that's derived from it, okay? And these are made for people who are allowed to consume them, you know, svaradim, even though Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim are also consuming this. And, uh, and it's a derivative. And they, so all, for all these reasons, 
um, many of these sweets and many of these candies that have lichitin or even some oils in them are permitted for Ashkenazim to consume on Pesach, okay? So again, I'm not saying you could have hummus, you can't have rice, those things you cannot have, but you could have these products that, that even though they say one can have these, uh, these products. Rav Weitman, who's the, the Rav Mashkiach of Tunuba, he says that most milky products like yogurt, cheese, milk, whose packaging says that they have kinyur in them, maybe even by Ashkenazim and Pesach, because the kinyur ingredients come in such minuscule amounts, they are fully absorbed in the product and nullified before Pesach. Okay, so this is uh, this is permitted. Can you do you need to sell your kidney out? No, you do not need to sell your kidney out. Can you eat at someone's home who eats kidney out? You could eat in someone's home who eats kidney out. They cannot serve you kidney out, but they could serve you from the same dishes that were used to make kidney out. Can you derive benefit from kidney out? Can you give kidney out to your dog or your cat? Yes, you can, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a few more, a uh, few more things. This is something that a few people have asked me about in the past. Uh, kidney oat for vegetarians and vegans. Is kidney oat permitted on Pesach? So I'm going to share with you that there's a link here to a tshuva by Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Daniel Mann, who writes, uh, he's part of the Eretz Chemda. You could read this article here in this link to see what he, uh, what he says about this. Um, you know, the, uh, in general, and Rav Moshe Lichtenstein also has a very spirited discussion on the Gush Lisserv about this. He felt very strongly that uh, you know, for vega, vegans, unless there's obviously some serious health reason why a person's a vegan or a vegetarian, that they should they should give up their um, their you know uh, veganism for a week because this is more important than uh, that particular uh, you know restriction. Even though he respects those who want to keep this, but he feels that on Pesach one shouldn't be uh, just disavow kidney oat for that uh, for that reason. Um, obviously, there are health reasons. It's, it's a different concern, but you could read a little bit more about this by Rabbi Daniel Mann in this tshuva, which I put on the sheet. And again, this this sheet here, this summary sheet here, is also in your email, so you could access it and read it in your own uh, in your own free time to review this and ask questions about it. So let's um, let's go to the let's go to the chat. Um, okay, so I'm seeing that someone told me here. Okay, one second. Okay, Herbie, so you wrote in. Let me just stop the share. One second. Okay, Herbie, you wrote that you bought cumin and it says no uh, no kidney oat. Okay, just Herbie, do you want to write in? What, what do you mean by that? Did it say that it's it's not an issue? It's possible that some Pascan that it's not uh, not an issue. The list that I have is from Herbie Ezra Malamid. Um, what about quinoa? So to Adam Thompson, quinoa is not kidney oat. You may have quinoa on, uh, on Pesach. Okay, so yes to quinoa. And uh, we'll talk about cumin uh, when uh, when Herbie writes in. Any other questions with regards to kidney oat on on Pesach? It could be confusing when you go to the store, and uh, it could be confusing. Go to the store, and uh, you don't know what the packaging says. If you have a question, take a picture of it. Send me a picture on your WhatsApp. I'm happy to take a look and try to give you an answer while you're still in the store, whatever it is. And this is how you could uh, you know figure out whether something is kidney oat or not kidney oat. Uh, for, um, you know, in terms of family customs, if the Ashkenazi woman marries a Sephardi man, then she can uh, obviously, is not have to hold by uh, Kinyot anymore. But if you have a Sephardi woman, uh, an Ashkenazi woman, who, a, 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 a Sephardi woman who marries an Ashkenazi man, she should, she should be keeping Kinyot. You follow the custom of your, of your husband. Okay, Paula Kweskin wrote in. Regarding the dairy products, is it safe to assume that only the Tunufa, tunufa products are okay to eat with the Kinyot labels? Or does this apply to all dairy brands? Um, I, I, I mean, listen, I need to check specifically, but the truth is it shouldn't be a problem. Again, you look at the, the ingredients and you see what is it that's actually in the ingredients. If you see a little bit of uh, cottonseed oil, you see a little bit of canola oil, you see lichitin, these things are all permitted because they are batel, they are nullified before Pesach. And uh, therefore it's, uh, it's not a problem. And uh, so you can, you can rely on this, but take a look at the ingredients. If you're not sure, you can send me a picture. You can, uh, you know, and uh, probably best to err on the side of caution if you're not sure, especially if there's another option on the, on the you know, in the, in the supermarket. But if there's no other option, you could, you could rely that it's, on the fact that it's fine. Um, is tofu kosher for, uh, for Pesach? So um, tofu is made out of soybeans, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, do, do I have that right? Is tofu made out of, uh, out of soy, soybeans? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so you have to see what, uh, what else is in, 
in the in the tofu in in the soy. Uh, Rav Dovlier again writes that for someone who has allergies and can only eat soy milk, therefore it's permitted. Uh, would I feel comfortable saying to someone regular, you know, a regular person, you know, have soybeans? Uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rush to rush to say that. Um, but um, but for soybeans, but if someone has an allergy, soy milk, uh, you know, is uh, is fine based on the hetar that it's not part of the original uh, decree. Um, what about mayonnaise? So it depends what's in the what's in the mayonnaise. Um, the um, usually it shouldn't be uh, what's in mayonnaise. I, I guess eggs and uh, sometimes if, you know I don't know they could, uh, what else is in mayonnaise. Usually it's not a problem the uh, the mayonnaise, but uh, you have to see what's in the ingredients. Um, but again, if there's a little bit of canola oil or a little one of these derivative kidney oats, it should not be uh, should not be a problem. Although mustard is considered a one of the kidney oat mustard seeds, and so mustard is a uh, is a problem on uh, on, uh, Pesach, uh, on Pesach when it's not allowed to eat uh, mustard because of uh, kidney oat. Um, but uh, so it depends what the man is. But you know, send a picture and uh, and we could take uh, we could take a look. Okay, with this we're uh, concluding. Part number two about uh, about uh, you know this review of Hilchot Pesach, which has to do with kidney. Now let's move on to the primary section, which has to do with um, which has to do with kashering your kitchen and cleaning for Pesach. Okay, let's just see by by show of hands, who here is excited about cleaning and kashering and cooking for Pesach? Okay, I want to see thumbs up if you're feeling very excited about this. Okay. Um, okay. And and who here is is a little bit nervous, a little bit, um, you know, not so sure. I see a sh thumbs up from Michelle Dolby. There we go. Okay. I want to see more thumbs up. Let's see more thumbs up here. Okay. Pesach is challenging. I I, I got to be honest with you. I don't care what any rabbi says. Pesach is hard. And um, sometimes we have to thank God that we forget things, because we forget how hard it could be. Uh, and I don't want to speak for women here, but it's the same thing with childbirth. But uh, you forget how challenging it is, and that's why people still have more children, no matter how uh, painful it is. And Pesach is also, it is challenging. I don't want to dismiss that fact. Of course, the more we prepare, the better. The more that we um, try to think about the bigger picture of what Pesach is about. And uh, you know, I would recommend, find some good podcasts, Torah podcasts, listen to some shurim. Try to when you're you're sitting and scrubbing or you're you know cooking or cleaning, you know, try to infuse that with uh, with some Torah learning, and I do believe that it will make the whole experience more um, uh, more meaningful. And uh, you know, but it is it is hard. And uh, but the idea is to be prepared. Don't kasher your kitchen on the Thursday before Pesach. Don't don't do it. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. So you lose out on having chametz one more day. Just kasher on Wednesday. Kasher on Tuesday. I was speaking to someone today who's planning on kashering their kitchen this Tuesday before Pesach. I'm not I'm not saying you should go that far, but just hachachami nav bro show. And uh, so so it's just something that. But but again, with knowledge, with understanding of what you need to do. It's also it's uh, it's easier to uh, to get by, and this is the goal here is for us to answer all your questions, so that you can uh, you can enjoy this process. Now, first of all, there's an idea of having simcha on the Torah Shulchan This Shulchan Aruch in uh, Siman Tav Kuf Kaf Tet says explicitly, "Chayav Adam Neot Sameach Tov Leiv B'Moed." Who be Yishtov and Avichol and Avimei Lav? You have to be happy. So when we're spring cleaning, we're a little bit less happy. There is no obligation to do spring cleaning. Okay, if you're on a ladder cleaning your roof, that is spring cleaning, that is not cleaning for Pesach. If you're scrubbing grout with a toothbrush, that is spring cleaning, that is not cleaning for Pesach. Uh, you know, you can't demand that others do these things either, not just you can't do it, other people should not be doing it as well. Okay, chametz is something we're very concerned about. Chametz represents arrogance, it represents the ego, it's our bloated selves. And, uh, and if there's anything we've learned from this time of Corona, it's that we have to have humility, okay? That uh, no matter how much we think we know about what should happen or what's going to happen in the world, we, we don't know, we don't know. And we have to have Yerach Hamayim. And Chamech represents the arrogance, the ego, the me, the, uh, you know, and we have to go and transcend that. And so Chamech, there are a number of restrictions with regards to Chamech. You can't eat Chamech. You can't derive benefit from Chamech. You can't give it to your dog, for example. You cannot own Chamech. Uh, or have it or stored in your home. 
and uh, and so we get rid of chametz. Okay, uh, how do we get rid of chametz? Uh, we get rid of chametz, you know, in a number of ways. We do bitul chametz, which is in which we mentally nullify the chametz, and we search out our chametz do bitikar chametz. We also do, and and then burn it eventually. We also do mechirat chametz. We sell the chametz. So we do all these things. We take all these actions to get rid of the chametz. If you look at your email that I sent out today, you can sell your chametz with the rabbanut, or you can come to shul for shacharit, uh, one of the mornings in the coming two weeks, and you could, I, I will help you uh, to sell your chametz. Now, what's interesting is that the same materials that are used to create chametz are also what's used to make matzah. It's the five grains, okay? And the five grains, chita, uh, sora, all of these things that are used to make matzah are also chametz. And it's what we learn from here is that you know, everything in life can be used for good or could be used for, for bad. Something could be matzah, it could be elevating, it could be a spiritually uplifting mitzvah, it could also be chametz, it could be the ego, it could be arrogance. And uh, this is also what we learn from this parasha. Parasha Bayakal, the Zahav, there's such a focus on the Zahav. I heard this in the name of, of uh, Sivan Rachav Meir. And she says, that what's the focus on the Zahav? The Zahav could be used to make a golden cap. The Zahav can be used to, uh, to build a mishkan. And so we have to remember when we're getting rid of the chametz that every aspect of our, every personality trait that, you know, every, every even flaw that we have can be used, can be channeled for the positive. Every koach, every that we have, we can use it for the positive or for the negative. Tov, where do you need to check for chametz? You need to check in places where you might have brought chametz, okay? If you eat behind your fridge, then you should check behind your fridge. I don't know anybody who eats behind their fridge. If you have, uh, if you had climbed the ladder to eat pretzels on top of your ceiling fan, then you should check on top of your ceiling fan. But um, it, it, there are certain places that you never access, and there's no way that you brought food to those places. You do not need to check these places. Okay. Now, if you have young kids, it's a little bit of a different story. You have to check, you know, more places. But for empty nesters, it's much easier. And if a children cannot reach a certain place, you don't need to check that place. Okay. Now. I'm going to share with you a, uh, a favorite trick, okay? That I, uh, you know, that I've learned over the years, and that is that any area that you are not going to, you know, access or need, and it could be a shelf in your kitchen, it could be a cabinet, it could be a, uh, a machsan, whatever it is, anything that has chametz in it that you are not planning on accessing or using that stuff, you're selling that stuff, you could put tape on it, you could put a little sign, and that's it. You don't need to check there. You don't need to clean there. You just close it up. You put tape there, you put tape there, you close up the cabinets, you know what, what area is being cordoned off, and that's it. You don't need to clean those places for chametz. Your toaster, your sandwich maker, which you're not going to cash for Pesach, put them in the cabinet, put tape on the cabinet, and that's it. You don't need to deal with it. Okay, and um, you don't need to clean things that you're going to sell and that you're not accessing on, uh, on Pesach. The things that you're going to be using, the shelves you're going to be using, you should wipe those down. But if you're not using the shelves, shelves, then you don't need to wipe them down. You could just close it off and sell that cabinet and make sure that that's in your chametz contract. What are we looking for when we do B'tikar chametz? We were looking for edible size food. That's a kezayat size. You don't need to open up your sfarim. There are those who are machmer, who check their sfarim to look for crumbs. We don't pass in that way. You were looking for large quantities of chametz, an olive size worth of, uh, worth of chametz. It's like equivalent to, to 30 grams. Okay, obviously we clean. We do clean. But you don't need to overturn every single uh, piece of clothing in your closet looking for chametz. And if there's no food in your closet, and you never take food into your closet, you don't need to check your closet. Okay, Tov, that is, um, that is with regards to cleaning generally. Any questions at this point about, uh, about cleaning or whatever it is? Uh, do you need to line cabinet shelves and fridge shelves? Okay, we're going to get there in a little bit, Evelyn. Okay, let's move on to actually uh, kashering itself. Now, um, <clears throat> let me explain to you something, an important distinction that will help you to understand how we kasher our dishes for Pesach. Now, let's say you have, a, uh, you have a dish. You have a dish, you have a pot that you used. Now, I look in the pot and I say, well, this pot is clean. I just put it into the dishwasher. It's totally fine. There's no food in here. And if there's no food, I should be able to use this pot on Pesach. Just like I used it before Pesach, I could use it on Pesach as well. And the truth is that even though there's no actual food, pieces of food, and I hope that there are no, there's no food in the dishes that are in your cabinets after they've been cleaned, 
there might be taste embedded in the walls, okay? And these are called gliot. These are immersions. These are things that are absorbed into the walls because when you use a pot to cook with heat, things get immersed in the walls of those pots. And it's only through heat that this happens. And this is based on the principle ta'am ki'ikar. The taste, the, um, uh, the absorbed taste, has the same status, same halachic status, as physical tamates, okay? Now, let me give you, now, something to, that's important to understand. So we have this pot. I have this pot in front of me. Let's say, let's say we, uh, we have this pot. Let's say there's a pot here, okay? You see my, my contigo thing. And uh, let's say, I, you know, I cooked in here. I cooked chametz in here. I cleaned it out. It's, there's nothing actually inside. But in the walls, embedded in the walls, is the taste of chametz. However, after 24 hours, the taste that's in these walls becomes ta'am pagum. The taste itself becomes defective, okay? Which essentially, it's essentially mutar. I can then meikar hadin, in principle, okay? Let's say this is my pot. I can use this pot for dairy, wait 24 hours, and then use it for meat. Wait 24 hours, use it for dairy, and switch back and forth, meat to dairy. This, in fact, is what one of the Rishonim, the Ra'ah, okay, is one of the Talmidim of the, the Beit HaRamban. He had one set of dishes in his home, and he waited 24 hours between using them, cooking with heat, and that's it, he had one set of dishes. Now, we don't do this. We all have two sets of dishes. Some of us even have three sets of dishes. Me, me do right it's totally permitted what he did. It's totally fine. Because again, after 24 hours, the taste is batel. And based on this idea, I'm going to tell you the answer to the most basic kasher question that rabbis get. The question is as follows. You know, I, uh, I heated up my meatballs from Shabbat in the microwave and I put it on a dairy plate. Meatballs on a dairy plate, what am I supposed to do? I heated it in the microwave, it was hot. Can I eat the food? What do I do with the plate? So what's the answer to this question? Answer is, well, when was the last time you used the plate? If the last time you used the plate was before 24 hours, okay, already 36 or 72 hours has elapsed, then the dairy that, that's embedded in that plate is batel. It's, it's tam lifgam. It's the defective taste. And so that the dairy embedded in that plate is not going to transfer taste through the microwave heat to your meatballs. So can you eat the meatballs? Yes, you can eat those meatballs. You can eat the meatballs, okay? Now, the plate itself needs to be kashered. Why does a plate need to be kashered? This is a gazera that you need to kosher the plate in, uh, in this situation out of concern of a situation where you, um, <clears throat> one second. you know, out of concern that, um, that you have a plate that was, uh, that was used within 24 hours. And a plate was used within 24 hours, you definitely would have to kosher that. And by extension, we say, even if something was used beyond, you know, after with a 24 hour difference, you should still kosher that as well. Okay, so that's the, you know, that's the answer. You could always, you could usually eat the food, but the, the plate or the spoon or the fork, you know, needs to be, uh, needs to be kosher. And we'll talk about how you can kosher something. That is during the, this is during, you know, meat and milk during the year. But Pesach is a little bit different. Pesach, we are more stringent. So whereas during the year, tam, the, the taste becomes defective after 24 hours, Okay, according to the Ramah, Rav Moshe Israelis, and or also according to the Shulchan Aruch, the uh, the the taste is after 24 hours is still uh, significant. Okay, and therefore you have to kasher on Pesach meikar hadin. You have to get rid of the taste that's in the walls of that pot. Not out of, uh, you know, not just because atu ben yomo, atu, uh, you know, because of the, the fact that you might have a pot that was used within 24 hours, so we kasher all pots, even something that wasn't used within 24 hours. No, you have to kasher, uh, you have to kasher me'ikar hadin out of principle, you have to kasher something, because we assume that the chametz that is embedded in those walls, okay, is we assume that it's something called isurabala, okay, it's, it's prohibited. Okay, even before Pesach, the Ramah Paskins, it's Isur Bala, it's prohibited. And even on Pesach itself, that stuff that's embedded in the walls can be, uh, can be problematic. Okay, and, uh, and therefore, you need to kasher these keli. So waiting 24 hours would be insufficient. You actually need to kasher these 
dishes. Okay, now we're going to talk about the different ways. The question is, how do we get the time? How do we get the taste out of dishes? Okay, so there are many different products and objects that we have in our kitchen. We have tables and we have countertops and we have sinks and we have refrigerators and we have dishwashers and we have, you know, sakum and we have plates and, and bowls and all these things are used, heat is used differently in each of these situations. So there's a principle called, called kibolo kachpoko. The way that something is absorbed into your, uh, your dish is the way that you extract it, okay? The same heat that's used to insert something is also how you get it out, okay? So for example, Let's take an oven pan. I bake cookies, milk cookies, on an oven pan I put into the oven. There's direct contact between the cookies, the dairy cookies, and the oven pan, okay? It's direct contact. Or if I'm making jachnun, and it's direct contact between the baking pan and the jachnun itself, the, you know, jachnun is chametz for sure, okay? So, the, and that's over a high heat. It's like over a direct fire. An oven is considered a direct fire. So I'm gonna have to, Get that baking pan to that same high level heat in order to extract the chametz that's in that baking pan if I want to use that baking pan. Okay, if something is in, you know, the heat is used in a microwave, what's considered essentially a steam or a recha, so it needs to be removed to the same level heat that you have in a microwave. If something is cooked on a pot, okay, on a fire, that's considered a kli rishon, so we have to get to the heat of a kli rishon in order to, uh, to get rid of it. And if something is just used for cold, Let's say I have, a, I have a cup, a plastic cup that I would never use for hot. A plastic cup, right? You know, it's, it's a you know, kid's cup. I would never use, put something hot into it. Even if I, even if I drink, uh, I don't know, a chamej drink in it, it's not going to get absorbed because cold doesn't absorb. Only heat gets absorbed into the walls. You just need to do shtifa. You just need to wash it. Okay, so let's talk about options for removal the different ways that we get things out of dishes and out of uh, kitchen objects. So we're gonna talk about two different things here. One is called libu ahagala, and the other one is called libu, okay? Hagala means that we, and I'm gonna to explain to you exactly how we do, uh, how we do hagala. Hagala removes the bliot, the immersions that are absorbed into a pot. And this is done through liquid, okay? So anything that, that gets absorbed through liquid gets extracted, that's get taken out through liquid. Okay, libun is when we apply direct fire to an, uh, to an object, okay? Hagala removes what's immersed in the walls, libun destroys. If I use a, uh, you know, if I use a, uh, a blowtorch, that's gonna destroy anything that's, uh, you know, on the, the cooking object. And um, one difference, uh, you know, and libun is about heating up something to a very, very high heat until it even has like white or red sparks. And uh, a self-cleaning oven is one example, essentially, of creating a status of libun. And uh, that gets rid of, um, uh, that destroys any chametz that you have in the walls. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about how you do hagala. okay? Let's say I have my pot. I have my pot. Here's my pot again. And I want to use this for Pesach. I use it during the year, and I want to use it now during Pesach. And I use it to cook all. I use it to cook porridge, and I use it to cook pasta, and I want to use this on Pesach. Okay, how do I do Hagalah on this object? Now you should just be aware that the Rabbanut, the Iriya, sets up places to do locations to do Hechsher Kevim. It's drive-in Hechsher Kevim. So when I sent this in the email, if you look in your email, you can uh, go to these different sites in Ranana and they will do this for you. Okay, but if you want to do this at home, it's very simple to do at home as well. First of all, you have to wait 24 hours from the last time that you used heat on this object. Okay, so wait 24 hours. Again, that makes the taste tam pagum. And then, um, and then what you do is you, uh, you see, you take one big pot, you know, that big pot, I heat it up to a very high heat on the, uh, on the flame. And uh, I put in some, you should put in some soap. Okay, soap makes something pagum as well. And uh, I have my big pot and I take my, uh, it's boiling hot. I take my silverware and I drop it on my, my fork and I have my knife. I want to cashew my silverware. I put it into the, uh, to the boiling hot pot, okay? And then I take it out and then it's kashered. It's kashered for Pesach, okay? And uh, if I have my, my pot, if I have this, I could also stick this whole thing in and kashew it in the, uh, in the pot. And that's how I can use it for, uh, you know, use it on, uh, use it on Pesach. Um, some have the custom also then to put the things under cold water. So you take out then the silverware, the dishes, you take this out from the big pot that's heated on the flame, 
and you put it under cold water, okay, it's a chumrah, it's a good thing to, uh, it's a good thing to do. Okay, now, um, what, what big pot can you use to put everything else in? Okay, so one option is to have a Pesach pot that you put aside that you have all, you know, that you don't use all year round. We have that. We have a huge, uh, you know, uh, soup pot that we only use on Pesach, and that's our kashering pot. The truth is you could use any big pot that you haven't used in the last 24 hours. Okay, you could use that, and um, you could, the truth is you should kasher it itself. So let's say you have a big pot. How do you kasher that, uh, that pot? You, um, you put water, and you, and you let, you basically, you know, you fill up the, 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 the fill it up on the flame, and then you um, and you pour water into it, you know, from the kettle until it overflows, and then your uh, your pot is kasher, and then you could use that to kasher everything else. And you could do hagala in that pot for uh, everything else. Now, a great time to kasher is immediately after Shabbat because you've already Shabbat. You haven't used this stuff to cook for 24 hours, so it's a good, it's a very good time to kasher if you want to right after um, right after Shabbat. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a few questions right now, and then we'll move on to going through which objects require Hagalah, what requires Libun. We're going to talk about barbecues, dishwashers, sinks, all these different things. Um, okay. Um, if I don't have a car, how do I access the Rabbanut Kashring service? Uh, either a friend or a uh, taxi. I think it's, uh, again, the locations are in the, or you could walk there, the locations are in the, uh, the email. Okay, we're going to talk about dishwasher, oven, and marble countertops. We're going to get to all those things right now. Okay. Things that you could do Hagalah on. We spoke about Hagalah. Hagalah, again, is you take this big pot, you heat it up on the fire, you put soap in, okay? And, and anything that you put in there, the taste is extracted from there, and the, whatever is absorbed in the pot, you could then use on Pesach. So first of all, silverware. Silverware, silverware you could throw in, and that's how you cast your silverware for Pesach. Number two is a pot, regular pots. You could throw into this big pot and kasher it for Pesach. Okay, um, number, okay, uh, number, uh, number four, number three, uh, you know, plastic dishes. Can you kosher plastic dishes? Many post scheme, um, Rav Moshe Feinstein was machmir about plastic because he felt the plastic was some new chemically made object. He wasn't sure that you could, uh, that you could, that you kosher it. Maybe it's like klicheres, maybe it's like clay. Clay, uh, you tend to clay dishes, we assume that when taste goes in, it's impossible to extract it out. Why can you not extract it out? Because you'd have to get it to a very high heat and, it's, and, and you're concerned it might break. So we assume anything that goes into a clay dish is impossible to, to get out. So Moshe felt the plastic was like clay. We do not paskin like this. We paskin that you can, you can cash your, uh, you know, plastic for Pesach. And, um, and so you can take your, uh, you know, put your plastic things into your big pot of Hagalah, it won't get ruined, you put it in, you take it out, and it's, uh, it's kashered for Pesach. By the way, if something's a big pot, and you can't get everything in at the same time into the, uh, into the Hagalah pot, uh, you know, the Rabbanun has these huge vats, huge vats, and they don't have issues with it. But if you do it at home and you don't have such a big pot, you could do it partially. You could do half like this, and then you put in the rest of it until you get the whole pot covered. It's not like a mikvah. Mikvah is tvilat killing. That's when you when you buy a new product that was owned by non-Jews, you do what's called tvilat killing. We're talking about hechsher killing when you're getting rid of chametz or any non-kosher that's in your dishes. Now, uh, next thing, countertops. Okay, um, what do we do about countertops? Okay, now what might be the concern with countertops? The truth is, um, you know, what might have happened on a countertop? Let's say um, I made, uh, I don't know, I made a, uh, a dish that has my, uh, I don't know, let's say some cholent, okay, falls onto my countertop. And cholent has, you know, grains in it, it has, uh, it has beans, it has grains, all these things that are, uh, you know, not barley, that are not kasher for Pesach chamed. And um, now the truth is this, uh, you know, the, this, the cholent is, you know, likely watery, let's say. It's, uh, it's considered an irui kli rishon. It's like pouring from something that's on the fire. Okay, it's not on the fire. The fi thing on the fire itself is a cholent pot. And then it's poured onto the countertop, which reduces the heat somewhat. So how do you, what do you deal with, uh, how do you get rid of, uh, what do you do about the, 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 uh, the countertop? So the Shulchan Aruch says that all you need to do is you take hot water, essentially, and you pour it on the countertop. Okay, and this is easy today. You take your kettle, you take your urn, you heat it up, and you pour the water on the countertop. 
and uh, you clean it out. Everything's cleaned, of course. You don't use it for 24 hours, and then you pour the hot water, and you can um, you can kosher your uh, your countertop. Um, the Mishnah Brura is a little bit more machner about this, and he suggests that because of a concern that there may be a chunk, a gush of, uh, of that has a very high heat that that holds heat in it, that it falls onto your countertop. So therefore, the truth is you need to use a more strict method, which is called Evan Miluban, in which you pour hot water and you're moving around this very hot stone that was put in the fire. Okay, we don't, we don't do that. That's a Chumrah that's using this Evan, uh, Evan Miluban. And, um, you know, and it's a very, you know, far, you know sort of far-reaching uh, chashash, far-reaching concern. So in practice, you have two options, okay? One option is to pour, is to clean your countertops, wait 24 hours after using the heat on them, and then kasher with your kettle, and you have to hit every spot on the countertop, okay? The flow of water from your kettle needs to hit every spot on your countertop, and you can then kasher your countertop. The other option is to cover the counters. You can cover it with whatever material you want to. Some people are concerned as a machloket. Does uh, pouring hot water onto your marble destroy the marble? Some, you know, feel very strongly that it does not. Others feel, oh my God, I got a crack in my marble. So, you know, you have to know what you think is going to work for your for your countertop, okay? But again, you just wait 24 hours and then you could pour hot water from the kettle, and that's called the irui kli rishon, and that uh, that is sufficient. Um, you know, so you could do both. You could, uh, and some are extra stringent. They do uh, irui, pouring the hot water, and they cover. But uh, you know, one can uh, either one of these two options is uh, is good. Um, now, uh, let's just see if there are any questions here. Okay, corningware. We'll uh, we'll talk about that. We will get to corningware in a little bit. Now, what about um, um, what about kashering? You know. Um, Okay, one second. Okay, what about different materials that you have in your countertop? So, you know, people have different things. Some are synthetic stones, some are composite stones, Caesar stone. So we paskin today, and this is based on many of the Kashri organizations, the Star-K, the CRC, you know, Formica, Granite, you can, you know, all of these things can be can be kashered. Okay, even composites, because the composites, again, have plastic. And if we're not paskin like Rav Moshe, you can paskin, you, you can kasher that as well. One thing that cannot be kashered is porcelain, okay? Again, which is some form of clay. So you cannot kasher porcelain, but you can kasher almost all the other types of stones uh, that you have for your countertop, okay? So that's in terms of countertops. You could cover, to summarize, you can cover, or you can uh, you know, wait 24 hours, clean everything off, wait 24 hours, and then use your urn and your kettle and you know, pour hot water onto uh, every spot, and then you could use it for, uh, for Pesach. Um, the same thing is true with a table, with a uh, kitchen table. Okay, what might happen to a kitchen table? How might, how might again, how might chametz be absorbed into your kitchen table? So uh, what's the concern? The chametz somehow got poured onto it. If, you know, a kid is eating, uh, you know, porridge in the morning and, and the porridge falls out and uh, as you have the heat absorbed from the porridge into the, uh, the table itself. And again, the Mishnah Bura and the, and the Ramah Pask in the same way that you should try to do Evan Miluban, which is you're pouring hot water over this, uh, this hot stone um, because, because there's a concern that maybe have been a gush, a, a chunk of uh, a very hot uh, chamet that gets onto your table. Um, the truth is that uh, one doesn't need, again, one doesn't need to be so machmer about this, and you have two options. You can either do Irui, irui Kli Rishon, where you're pouring, you clean the table 24 hours after using it for heat, and then you pour you know, water all over the table, although that can ruin a table, so you have to be careful. Uh, the other option is to cover the table, cover the table with a, uh, with a tablecloth, a clean tablecloth, and that's also a very good option. So table is essentially the same as a countertop in this regard. Uh, if you're not willing to, to uh, you know, pour hot water onto it to kasher it, so then you can uh, you can cover. Um, okay, let's now talk about sinks. Okay, um, let's talk about sinks. Now, one of the variables: what happens in a sink, and what materials you know are problematic. Now, um, what happens in a sink is that usually you're using cold water in a sink, but sometimes you use hot water. The truth is the water you use is not even so, so hot because otherwise it would burn your hands, okay? So is there real absorption into the walls of the sink? 
No, uh, yeah, there is. You know, the you know majority of time is is uh, lukewarm water or cold water, and this is a difference between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. The Shulchan Aruch tends to rule that you go you kasher something according to the heat of rov tashmisho, the way that it's generally used, the average type of usage. The Rama, Paskening for Ashkenazim, say you have to go by the most stringent form of absorption. And we're seeing this play out through a number of different objects in the kitchen. And um, now the truth is also another uh, mitigating factor is that you use soap in, uh, in your sink. And soap is pogame. Soap causes whatever taste that would get absorbed to become defective. Okay. So, uh, so this is, you know, is to your advantage. Now, again, if you have uh, a, a sink that's made out of klicheres, that's made out of clay or porcelain or enamel, that's a problem. But if you have klicheres, if you have a sink that's made out of stainless steel or uh, even plastic, you know, silicone quartz, for example, so it's less problematic. Okay, so there are two different ways to deal with, uh, with the sink. Okay, one more lenient view is that you clean your sink well. Yeah, you dry it, and then you do we weekly reshon, which we've been speaking about. You uh, you take the water from the kettle and you go around at every part on the uh, of the uh, of the sink. This is based on the Shulchan Aruch, who says that we go by the majority usage of the sink, which is for cold. And uh, this would even work for uh, for a clay sink, according to the Shulchan Aruch, because clay is uh, because you go by rov uh, rov tashmisho, which is for cold, and you're using uh, so most of the time, so the chametz is not even absorbed into the walls. Uh, and so this is this is the more lenient opinion. The more stringent opinion in sinks is that you uh, you kasher the sink just as we spoke about, and you use plastic bowls in the sink, and maybe you don't even use uh, you don't even use uh, hot water. Uh, if your sink is made out of clay, you know this you should definitely do this. If your sink is made out of clay, you should use uh, you know uh, bowls for meat and for dairy instead in your sink. You use inserts, whatever they are, but um, if it's stainless steel, you could definitely, you can kasher the sink as we spoke about, and you could rely on this. You clean it out, you wait 24 hours after not using it for heat, and then you do Irui Kliri shown throughout the, uh, throughout the sink. What materials, again, cannot be kashered? Ceramic, porcelain, enamel, but other things, uh, you know, silicates, it can be kashered as a form of plastic. You can kasher stainless steel, of course, and uh, you know, if anyone asks you what what type of sink should you buy, stainless steel is definitely, from a kashrut standpoint, is the best option. Okay, it's definitely the uh, the best option when you're doing irui on the sink. When you're pouring again from the kettle, the boiling hot water you should pour water on the faucet itself as well, and the, and the tap, and uh, and you know, and on the drain, and the uh, and and uh, you know, you could do this on the uh, you know the racks as well. Again, if they're metal. Um, but for the racks, by the way, you can do, uh, you could put them into, you could do a Haggala if you want to use the racks, or you could use different racks for, um, for Pesach. Okay, questions until this point. Okay, glass dining table, someone asked about. Okay, so a few things. Let's go, let's go back. Let's go back to, um, okay, we're going to get to the dishwasher. Okay, um, excellent video tutorial about Kasher and Countertop and Sears Web from the Chicago Rabbinical Council. Karen, uh, please feel free to send that link to the chat so everybody could see it. What about a sink? So we just spoke about the, uh, the sink. Um, if you have any more questions about it, feel free to ask. What about granite? So again, granite, you can kasher by pouring hot water onto it and, uh, and doing irui, what's irui clearly shown. But you may want to be careful if you think the hot water is going to destroy your granite. And I don't want to be responsible before you say, oh, well, the rabbi said we could kasher our granite by pouring hot water onto it. Then your granite gets destroyed, and then I'm going to get in trouble, and then no one's going to be happy this, uh, this Pesach. So if you think your granite might be destroyed, then cover it. But if not, then you can do irui, and, um, and it's not an issue. Okay. Um, a question about what is true about eating vitamins like calcium, which is not marked kosher for Passover. So I would say as follows. Uh, any, any vitamin, okay, and this is true of medicine as well, that has a taste to it. So some of the sugar-coated vitamins or, or sugar-coated vitamins or the gummies uh, or sugar-coated Advil, whatever it is, those you need to make sure are kasher for Pesach because there's taste in it, okay? For medicine or vitamins that have no taste, they're not food. You swallow them, you don't eat them. There's no problem with using them on Pesach. If you want to be extra stringent and go and find calcium that's kasher for Pesach, you know, you should get extra points in Shemayim. You don't have to do this, though, okay? But if it has a taste, you do. Okay? You have to make sure it's kasher for Pesach. If you cannot, it's an important medicine. The truth is any important medicine doesn't have taste, okay? 
the uh, you know, but if for whatever reason you, you absolutely have to have it, so uh, you know, then uh, we could we could talk about it. But it, there shouldn't be any situation where that applies. Now, glass dining room table again. A glass dining room table, you have to be careful that you're going to pour boiling hot water on it, it could crack. So glass dining room table, I would recommend covering as opposed to trying to, uh, you know, clean it off, get all the dirt or any chametz off and then cover it. And uh, that's, that's my recommendation. I would not do, I would not try to kosher a glass uh, dining room table. Okay, let's talk about the dishwasher, okay? Um, in terms of a, uh, a dishwasher, the... Um, you know, um, there's there is room to be there is room to be uh, there's some who are very stringent about a dishwasher. What happens in a dishwasher? Let's talk about what happens. Uh, is a dishwasher considered a, a cleavage shown something that's like hot the heat? You know, that's equivalent to being on the fire, uh, or is it considered a cliche? So there are those who argue. Well, it depends how the dishwasher works. Sometimes your dishwasher heats up the water inside the dishwasher. You know, uh, basin. And sometimes it's heated up outside of the dishwasher and then it comes into your dishwasher. So it's really a cliche knee and it's less hot. So, um, you know, so there are those who are stringent that, um, you know, that you need to do, essentially you need to do a hagalah on a dishwasher. Now, I don't know about you, but it's impossible to turn your dishwasher inside out and then put it into a big pot, uh, you know, of boiling hot water. It's impossible to do that. So you can't do that. So the only way to kasher it is to, you know, do hagalah, which is you're pouring hot, boiling hot water you know, and use an Evan Miluban, again, this uh, boiling hot stone, which is in the fire. We don't do this. It's impossible to do that. But um, others feel that, listen, the hot water that you have in your dishwasher is essentially an Irui Klirishon. It's spritzed it's water that's, that's spritzing into it from a, uh, you know, from the, the, the heating device of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the dishwasher. And therefore, just like the, the you know, the chametz gets absorbed into the dishwasher, you could also extract it that way. So what do you need to do? So Rav Moshe, Rav Eliezer Melamed, uh, and uh, this is what I recommend people to do who, uh, who ask about this. You have to clean out your dishwasher really, really well. You got to really clean it thoroughly. Take out all the pieces, take out all the gook, clean the sides, clean the, any, all the inserts. Everything's got to be cleaned 100%. And then you wait 24 hours, okay? And then you kosher it by putting it on the highest cycle, with, you know, you put one or two or whatever things of soap inside with the racks inside and you let it run for the longest cycle on the highest heat. And then you're, again, you're meeting the equivalent heat that you would use for, uh, that you'd use it. That's how the chametz gets absorbed. This is how you're going to extract it. But again, you have to clean it out very, very thoroughly. And then you could use your dishwasher on, uh, on Pesach. Okay. The next thing that also using Hagala is your Kurigur Nespresso machine. Clean it well. Don't use it for 24 hours. You take that cupcake, the, the, the holder that you put the, uh, the, uh, the capsules into, and you do, you do hagalah on that, okay? You put that into you know, a pot of boiling hot water uh, with soap in it, et cetera, on, on, that's on the heat. And then you, you take it out. You ru run a kosher cup through the machine of, uh, you know, of uh, kosher La Pesach coffee, and then you can use your Keurig or an espresso machine on Pesach itself. Okay, what about an urn? So an urn, in theory, uh, you know, chametz doesn't really get into it. Um, however, uh, some have the concern the chametz can fall inside. Um, you know, so okay, out of that concern, you can uh, get rid of all the, the schmutz inside, all of the um, all of the white uh, residue, and um, and uh, and then you heat it up and you let the water flow out. That's what you could do with the inside of the urn. In terms of the lid, some people put the challah on top of the lid. Okay. Um, if you do that, you then need to clean off the lid thoroughly, wait 24 hours, and then you could do. You have to do hagalah on the top of your uh, on the top of your lid with a lid. Okay, you have to put it into a boiling hot, you know, thing of water, and you have to do hagalah. We tend to. Uh, my wife puts the challah sometimes on top of the uh, the urn, so that's how we have to kasher the uh, the lid. You put it in the. Uh, you do hagalah on the lid. Yeah, these are all the things that require some form of hagalah, which is putting something into a pot of boiling hot water or pouring boiling hot water onto something. These are all the things that are included under the category of Hagalah. Okay, any questions at this point? Um, okay, so uh, Karen sent the, uh, sent the video, how to cash your kitchen, Nachon, it's a good video. And that video is also linked into the source sheet, the, the review sheet of uh, cashering for Pesach that I sent you also in the email, so check the email. Um, okay, 
Um, lactates, for those who are lactose intolerant, are OU but not OUP. Do you have any idea if there are or are not acceptable uh, for Pesach? Okay, we'll talk about this afterwards. Um, water minibar. I mean, think about a water minibar. Does, does, does Hamid ever get into a... Uh, uh, you know, get into a water water mini bar. The answer is no. Okay, uh, you should clean it. Make sure there's no chametz around. You don't need to kasher it, but make sure that you know you should clean it. Okay, many I'm, I'm told that many Nespresso type pods are always kosher for Passover all year round. So I would say two things to that. Number one, you have to make sure that you're only using the Nespresso type pods. Okay, if you're not sure if you have, then it does need to be kashered. But number two, it's possible that you threw the Nespresso, you know, pieces into the dishwasher at some point. So it may have absorbed something that was, you know, mixed in with chametz in the dishwasher or mixed in the sink with all the other stuff. So it is good to, uh, to kasher it if you want to use it for Pesach. But if you're 100% sure that you never did that and you only use Nespresso pods, then it's fine. No problem. Okay, let's move on to the next part which is uh, things that just require shtifa, things that you just need to wipe down or wash. First of all, the fridge. You don't need to cover things in the fridge, by the way, okay? You can symbolically do it if you want to, but you don't have to. You need to clean out your fridge from all chametz, wash it down, but you don't need to stick the, the fridge uh, you know, shelves into a, uh, you know, do hagala or do libun on those things. But, and this is really key, and this is probably where you will find more chametz than anywhere else in your house, breadcrumbs that are in the freezer, okay? For those of you who store bread in the freezer, there's tons of breadcrumbs. You gotta get rid of all those breadcrumbs from the freezer. You may wanna take everything out, clean it properly. But again, it's just using cold water to clean. Uh, number two, uh, your dentures or a retainer, okay? Um, you just, uh, you know, you to, most people don't have boiling hot water in their, in their mouth, uh, you know? So, you're, the, so the dentures and the retainer come in contact with Things that are you know warm or hot but not boiling hot so uh, all you need to do is you, you clean them out properly make sure that there's no uh, chametz in your dentures or your retainers some are to do hadala but it could ruin it so be careful number three let's talk about glass dishes okay on pesach and here we have a machlok between svaradim and ashkenazim okay svaradim paskin what, what is the status of glass does glass absorb any chametz so Sfaradim Paskin, and this is all year round and on, Chame, on Pesach as well, that glass does not absorb. Even with heat, glass never absorbs things, okay? It's called, it's shi'i, it's, it's smooth, and something can never be absorbed in glass, even through heat. There are some Sfaradim or Machmer, those who follow the Ben Ishchai, but generally uh, we Paskin that it's not an issue. So Sfaradim can use glass for meat and for dairy during the year, and end for during the year and for Pesach. It's got to be cleaned out. You got to make sure there's no chametz in it, but you could, uh, you could use it. Ashkenazim are more stringent when it comes to glass, okay? Because the concern is a chashash, a concern that glass is treated like clay. It's made out of sand. And, uh, you know, sand is similar to, to clay and it's melted down and, uh, and it's made into glass. And therefore, maybe something can get absorbed in the glass and you can never extract it from glass. So we're especially stringent about glass, specifically on, on Pesach. And the concern is that you used hot chametz on a glass dish and you'll never be able to, uh, to extract it. Okay, so, um, so you know, lemaseh, lemaseh, Ashkenazim, do not use glass or Pyrex on Pesach that they use for the rest of the year, unless it's mamash ashat hatchak, unless it's really, uh, you know, you really have no other option. But one otherwise should not be, should not be uh, using this. Rav Vadi Yosef happens to Paskin, and there's a very sort of Sephardic centric type of approach, uh, which most people don't follow, that Ashkenazi who moves to Israel can do Hatarana and Darim and, uh, and follow the Shita of the Shulchan Aruch, that glass can be permitted on Pesach. But unless you follow Rav Vadi Yosef for everything, I wouldn't recommend following him for this, uh, for this either. Um, now, the, um, what about Karel? Okay. Um, Karel. Is um, is the same thing as uh, is glass. Okay, so we don't kasher it for Pesach, and one should not use it on uh, on Pesach. Now, this is for dishes, and this is for Pyrex, and you know, etc. What about glass cups? So you know, glass cups are usually uh, wine glasses, for example. Wine glasses are, you know, you don't use them with chametz, and you don't use them with heat. You use them for wine. Okay, so. Um, you know, but 
There is a concern that you may have used them for, uh, so for Sfaradim, again, it's totally, it's not a problem. And uh, even if they were used for chametz, uh, it's not bolea, it's not an issue. The Ramah, though, is concerned about this, that maybe you use something with beer or whiskey, and because beer is, uh, whiskey at least is the bar harif, it could, kavush uh, kemavushal, it could soak in and immerse into the walls, even after just uh, 18 minutes, this is a chumrah. What I, what I would say about glass cups is as follows. You know, the, um, you know, you, uh, the Mishnah Bura says explicitly that if you could just buy a new set, you should buy a new set. Okay, he says this in uh, Siman, Taf Nun Aleph, you know, Kuf Nun Vav, you should just buy new glasses. And the truth is that new glasses uh, are, are very, very cheap here in Israel. Just get a new set of glasses, of drinking glasses for Pesach, and you keep them from year to year. If you feel that it's a bit expensive or you feel that it's a waste, what you can do is something called milui v'irui. Milui v'irui is when you take your glass cups, you put them in water, eh, regular water, for 24 hours, and you take out the water, you put them in for another 24 hours, you do this three times, and uh, this gets rid of the uh, whatever is absorbed in the cups. So you can then use your wine glasses, uh, you know, or something that, I, I wouldn't use your whiskey glasses, but if you have wine glasses and you want to use them, you could then use this as one way to use them on, uh, on Pesach. Okay. Um, the, um, okay, uh, if, if you have uh, metal Kiddush cups, you could do Hagalah on them because there's a concern, maybe use them again for whiskey. And uh, Sfaradim would just need to just wash out the Kiddush cups. Uh, I remember my, you know, growing up, my mother would always shine the, uh, the Kiddush cups before Pesach, so it's a good time to do it. it, it when we sit at the Seder, the Lel has said there, that we sit at the Seder table, you know, we're supposed to put our nicest dishes on. So it's a good thing to do to make everything, you know, really beautiful. Okay, um, question I see about Pyrex. Yeah, so again, Pyrex, uh, Ashkenazim do not use Pyrex if they use the rest of the year on, uh, on Pesach. Uh, I'm not sure what our Korok is, um, but I'll have to look into that. Okay, so remind me, Evelyn, just send me a text message and I will uh, look into our Korok. Okay, let's move on a little bit further and we're just, a, you know, we're going to do a few more minutes and then we're going to call it the night. Uh, things that would require libun chamor. Libun chamor is when you have to heat something up to the heat of a direct fire, okay? And the truth is we generally don't kasher these things because it's impossible to do that. What are these things? Number one, a toaster. You can't kasher a toaster. Uh, you want to clean it out, you know, put it away, okay? Uh, baking dishes. Baking dishes, uh, if you put a blowtorch or you try to heat it up to a very hot heat, it's going to, you know, dis dis dismember your baking dish. Just buy a new one. You can, if you want, put it into a self-cleaning cycle in the oven, which we'll talk about, but just be aware that you know, it might you know, you know, change shapes. Okay, let's talk about the, the oven. If ovens, let's talk about ovens. If you have a self-cleaning oven, it's very simple. You don't need to do anything. You, uh, you, know, you, uh, you turn on your, uh, your self-cleaning cleaning oven and it will burn and destroy anything that is inside your, uh, your oven and you can clean it, uh, use it on, uh, for Pesach. It obliterates everything. Um, you know, you don't even, uh, you know, you don't even need to wait 24 hours. Just put on the self-cleaning option. The other option, if you have a non-self-clean oven, is, uh, is you have to then clean it thoroughly. Okay, you have to get rid of everything. You wait 24 hours since you've used the last, and then you put it on the highest heat for an hour. And, uh, and, uh, and this is, again, it's the same heat that you would, it would have, things would have been absorbed. And you could rely on you could rely on that for a non self cleaned oven. In terms of the uh, in terms of the racks themselves, uh, some people have specific uh, you know um, you know there there are a few different options here. Um, you can in a self cleaning oven you could put the keep the racks in and that will kosher them no problem. Uh, in a non self cleaning oven it's probably ideal to uh, you know to either cover the uh, cover the racks with uh, with aluminum foil. Um, or uh, yeah, that, that's what that's what I would recommend. You should cover the racks with aluminum foil, and um, or if you're, you know, if you're always if you're using you're gonna you're, if you're not gonna put anything directly on the racks, you're gonna have baking trays, so then you don't need to cover the racks. If you're gonna put something directly onto the racks, uh, you know, uh, you're putting your matzah pizza in, so then you have to cover the uh, the racks. If not, you can just uh, you know if you're using baking trays or, or you know cooking dishes. So then you don't need to cover them, but you have to, of course, uh, they have to be kashered uh, in the oven when you um, when you put the uh, when you clean the oven. Um, okay, 
uh, porcelain and clay dishes, in theory, you'd have to do uh, libun to them. And you can't do that. So any porcelain or clay dishes need to be put away. You cannot use them on, uh, on Pesach. This is true even for anything that's porcelain that has to do with glaze, which is what many of our dishes are. We treat these like klicheres, according to the Mishnah Bura, Siman Tafnun Aleph, and one is not allowed to do that. What about a Shabbat blech or a plata? So a blech itself is, uh, it comes in contact with the red I don't even know anyone who uses a blech anymore, but uh, you would have to do libun, <laughs> properly blow torch this till it's boiling hot. Not a good idea. It's going dis- to you know, totally destroy your blech. But when it comes to an electrical hot plate, uh, plata, uh, clean it. You have to clean it well, okay? Leave it for 24 hours and then turn it on for an hour. And, uh, and that's the way that you use it. And, uh, and cover it with tinfoil. It's important to cover it with tinfoil, and then you could use your plata on, on Pesach. Uh, what about the grates, the chatzuvot, on your, uh, on your stove top? These come in direct, uh, you know, your pasta, you're making pasta, and it falls onto the grate in the middle of cooking. So in theory, you need libun gamor, you need direct heat to destroy this. However, the truth is that anything that comes in direct contact with the grates fires on and it's immediately destroyed meaning there's always this direct fire that's coming out from the uh, the grates and uh, and therefore we pass in with regard to the uh, to the grates that you can uh, basically what you do is you you clean the whole area okay and you uh, you know and you take a metal sheet or some pot whatever it is you put it on top of the uh, the metal grate and you turn it on for 30 minutes and you can uh, that kashers the uh, the grates themselves Okay, um, you know, you could also put them in the oven if you want to during a self-cleaning cycle. That's, uh, that's another option, but you could just turn it on to high heat for 15 minutes and this will kosher the, the grates themselves. Um, you know, the area between the grates, um, you know, you should cover this area. Um, you know, it's, you know, we don't uh, definitely clean it. We don't want anything to, you certainly don't want any food to get on there and to touch it. And so it's best to cover the area in between the, uh, in between the grates on your, uh, on your stove top. Um, okay, what about, um, okay, what about, so the cl- two things, glass stove tops and induction stove tops. Does anybody here have a glass stove top? Glass or induction stove tops, okay? So, okay, I see Bobby Flex asked about this. Okay, uh, I see Reed also has it. Uh, how, what are you gonna do about a, uh, okay, so let's see, kosher, if someone else also asked about induction stovetop. Um, let me just answer Juliet's question first. If you're not going to use the chametz wine glasses, do you need to put them away or can you leave them out in a cabinet? Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not, um, you know, it's good for them to be, um, to be covered. If you're not using them, and uh, you know you should. It's good to cover them up. It's good to, that there be a siman that this is sort of non pesadik and uh, you know to not see them. That, that's what I would recommend. Let's talk about induction stovetops now. See, Faith also has an induction stovetop, and uh, David, David Wiesel also does. So a number of the glad you know inductions are becoming more popular in glass stovetops. So how do you what do you do for a glass and induction? So for a glass stovetop. Uh, there's always a concern that you, uh, you know, that, that it won't kosher well and that it could break. Um, you know, have you, the, the burners themselves, you turn them to the highest setting until they grow red, and, uh, and that's kosher. The problem is this space in between. So, um, you know, one option is to boil water from a kettle and to kosher it through irui, as we spoke about doing irui, pouring hot water onto it between the burners. Um, you know, but uh, some are concerned that this might break the, uh, break the glass. Um, so the other option is to, uh, is to try to, uh, you know, to try to cover it. Um, you know, so there, there's, uh, you know, these are the two options that are available, but you want to make sure obviously that you don't destroy your, uh, your glass stovetop. So there are questions about, you know, is this the ideal type of, uh, you know, stovetop to have, but if you have it already, again, the burners, putting them on the highest heat and you either cover the space in between, um, which again, might cause them to crack, so you have to be careful about that, but cover with, you know, tin, tin foil, or, um, you know, you do irui on it, but just be careful that nothing, nothing breaks. In terms of an induction stovetop, how does induction work? Uh, induction works, in, uh, you know, I, I can't explain to you the, the mechanics or the science behind it, but basically, if you were to touch the, the top of the stove top, it's, it's essentially cold until you put the metal on, so you put the metal pot on. So how do you, you know, how do you kosher something like this? Because the only way to get it to high heat is by putting a dish 
you know, a metal, uh, a metal uh, pot on the, uh, on the stove top itself. So the, uh, the answer of what to do here is that, um, is that you actually put some, you put some water, you put a little bit of water on top of the, uh, on top of the burner. Okay. And then you put the pot down. Okay. And, uh, and when you put the pot down, it will cause the water to boil on the burners. And, uh, and you lift the pot a little bit so that the water penetrates the space under it. And you let it boil. And this is how you kosher the top of your induction, uh, your induction stove top. And uh, it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be an issue. And uh, the areas in between, again, you could do Irui, you know, pour a hot water on top of it. And, uh, and you can cover it with, uh, you know, again, heavy duty alum aluminum foil. And, uh, and, and this way, if anything falls down there, you know, you're not concerned about it touching an area where there's chamet beforehand. Okay, next, uh, does, anyone in, does anyone use uh, warming draws? Anyone use warming draws? Again, we're gonna talk about microwaves in just a second, Adam. Anyone use warming draws? Is that something that people even use in Israel? Uh, anyone use warming draws? Okay, so if you have a warming draw, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the way to cast your warming draw, there's a whole, uh, there's a way to do it. The Star K tells you that, um, you know, the Star K basically actually argues that you can't use it at all, a warming draw, because it's very hard to get to the uh, high enough heat of, uh, of Libun to get rid of what's in the, uh, been absorbed into the walls of the warming draw. The CRC says that you could use sterno cans and that heats it up sufficiently to, uh, you know, but if no one has a warming draw, we're not gonna get into the details of a warming draw. Let's talk about um, a barbecue, okay? Can you kosher your barbecue for Pesach, okay? A lot of people like to barbecue on Pesach. So I actually sent out a video about this a few days ago. And this is what I would, um, this is what I would say about the barbecue. And there's a lot of gook that's on a barbecue and you need to get rid of all that gook and all the oil and all the stuff that's, that's stuck to it. And it's very hard, it's very hard to do that. You essentially need to do libum. You have to use direct fire, a blowtorch or the equivalent of that in order to get rid of everything in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the barbecue. So the first thing you need to do is you need to clean everything out. You gotta clean it out and, uh, and you know, you know, scrub it down. Uh, which is a hard thing to do. The next thing is you use, you know, you actually you need to use a blowtorch to very hot heat. And this could in theory ruin your barbecue. Um, now, however, however, um, some of the websites, the Star K, for example, says that what you can do is as follows. You could um, you could put the grates of the grill, you know, stick them in between the coals, and you, you know, heat up the coals to be uh, to very hot, and. Uh, and, uh, and this will kosher the, uh, the grill itself after you clean the grill and then you, 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 you put all these briquettes, you put all these uh, the coals there. And uh, you also do the same thing with the cavity. So you fill up the whole barbecue, the racks on the bottom with coals, you heat it up to very high heat, you close it and that will kosher it, okay? Um, the, um, you know, you have to make sure that you do this safely, of course. The other option, and especially if you're going away, this is what I would recommend. Just get a little hibachi, uh, you know, grill, okay? And you buy coals and it's very, you go to a park, you go to a simmer and you have it with you. It's very easy. You don't bring it home. You're done with it. It costs 50 shekel. Alternatively, you could buy a George Foreman. You could buy one of these electrical, uh, you know, cookers and use that if you want to grill on Pesach. But the truth is, if you're at home and you have the time and you could properly clean your, uh, you know, you're willing to have the time to, to clean your grill properly, you can do it. And watch the video that I sent out a few days ago about how you can kosher your your grill on Pesach with the uh, you know using uh, coals, etc. Okay, what about a frying pan? Sfaradin Paskin for the frying pan. Usually you're using oil, and therefore there's a liquid involved. And now you can you do have a lot with a frying pan. Uh, however, Ashkenazim are more stringent. They say, listen, you're not always using uh, water and liquid as a medium when you use a frying pan. First of all, it could also get dried up, and then you have direct heat between the food and the pan, and it's no different than a baking pan, and therefore um, you'd have to do libun, uh, some form of libun on a frying pan. Uh, Teflon pans can definitely not be kashered. For a frying pan, I recommend go out and buy a frying pan special for Pesach. You'll have it from year to year. Although if you do need to kasher, you could bring it to the, uh, the area and they'll do libun. I don't recommend anyone doing libun at home. That's the truth. Unless you want to try in your barbecue, but don't do Libun at home, bring it to the area and they will do it for you. Hagala, you could do it at home. Libun is very hard to do at home. Okay, microwave. 
How does something get absorbed to a microwave? Through uh, heat, through steam. So clean out your microwave. Don't use it for 24 hours. And then you put a cup of, uh, of water and you put it in for 10, 12 minutes, whatever it is. Let, the, uh, let it heat up and the steam will go around and around and this will kosher your microwave. Now, just you should be aware, the, sometimes if you use a glass cup, it can crack, okay? You should just be aware of that. You know, maybe you, uh, you, you, uh, you know, put in for seven minutes, it's fine as well. It doesn't need to be 15 minutes. But, uh, and this will kosher your microwave. Again, you have to just make sure that it's clean and then you could use, uh, then you could use the, uh, the microwave. On, uh, on Pesach, uh, blenders and mixers, these are things that have lots of cracks and small pieces, um, you know, if you used it only for cold. So all you need to do is make sure that it's clean. Uh, unless, of course, if you use these things for dough. If you use the sieve, you know, for flour, we don't use those things on Pesach. It's very hard to, uh, to capture these things. You should just put it away. Um, you know, if you have a blender, you can use it. If you haven't used it for heat, just clean it and you could use it. Just make sure there's no chametz or no dough on it. Uh, if you use it for heat, then you have to do hagalah on the, uh, the blender pieces and the mixers, etc. Okay, towels, oven mitts, you could just clean them and make sure that there's no chametz in them and you could use it. Uh, high chairs for kids, just clean them and then you could use it, wipe it down, and uh, etc. Okay, so this is the, um, these are basically all the objects that I have on my list that might appear in your kitchen. Um, does anybody have any more questions about kashering the kitchen for Pesach? Anything that I did not hit up that, uh, that is in your kitchen that you want to know about? I still need to get back to you about, uh, Evelyn, about our, our uh, you sent me a text about it, our, our Karok, whatever it is. Okay, that was one question. Uh, let's talk about the, um, someone asked about, someone asked about lactate, lactate pills. Okay, I need to look into the lactate pills. Um, if there's nothing, you try to obviously find something that's kasher the Pesach. Um, but again, if these are pills, if you're not eating them, okay, if you're just ingesting them, it shouldn't be a problem. We don't have an issue with, uh, it's not considered food. Um, no dog would eat lactate pills, and therefore it should not be an issue. If you could find something that's kasher Pesach, do so, but otherwise it's, uh, it's fine. Um, okay, toiletries. Um, okay. Uh, Jake, do you, uh, what's the custom in the Levant home? Do you guys eat toiletries? What's the, um, what do you guys do? Do you guys, anyone here consume toiletries on a regular basis? No, that's what I'm saying. I just want to make sure in that toothpaste, I just want to know where the, the bar ends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. So, so, so it's a good question. with food bait, with chametz in them, yeah. you know, perfumes and toothpaste. Yeah, yeah. And where does yeah. it go? So, so, so um, you know, all of this stuff, soaps, shampoos, Perfumes, even if they have alcohol in them, are not an issue on Pesach, okay? Cosmetics, you don't need to get rid of these things. Anything that's not re'u'i l'achila kelev, that a dog wouldn't eat, is not prohibited on Pesach. A dog will not eat shampoo, and it will not eat soap, and it will not, you know, drink perfume. So all of these things are, uh, are permitted. Um, the, um, in, terms of, in terms of toothpaste, um, there is, you know, once you get a new toothbrush, by the way, that's for sure. Okay. Um, in terms of toothpaste, there's an interesting um, machloket about toothpaste. Um, give me one second. Let me just. Um, um, there's, a, oh, there's a famous story about Rav Soloveitchik with toothpaste. Um, where um, this is Rabbi Jacker, Jacker quotes. I'm going to read this to you, okay? A charming anecdote that occurred in Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik Shir at Yeshiva University in the 1970s uh, is often cited in support of the common practice to be lenient about toothpaste. The Rav stated in Shir that toothpaste is not Rav Yilachila Kelev, unfit for dogs to eat. And as one is permitted to consume it on a Pesach, even if it contains chametz. The next day in Shir, a student raised his hand and explained that he conducted the experiment the night before. He related that he placed toothpaste in his dog's feeding bowl to see if his dog would eat. And indeed, the dog ate a toothpaste. You know, Rav Salvejic simply responded, your dog is crazy, okay? And, uh, and so he didn't think this was normal. It's an aberrant behavior. He didn't think this is normal for a dog to do this. And therefore, it's, uh, it's not a problem. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Shimon Eder, also Paskin, it's not Rui Lachila Kelev. And therefore, um, if there's no issue with, uh, with toothpaste. If, uh, if you're buying new toothpaste anyway, you should buy something that is a, uh, you know, Raoui, uh, you know, that uh, 
rice thing that's kashul pesach, Rav Amital, Rav Lechantin also paskin that it's not an issue, and that um, you know so so toothpaste is not an uh, not an issue uh, either. But if you want to be a little more stringent and you're buying new new tooth toothbrushes, you can go get kashul pesach uh, toothpaste as uh, as well. Uh, is a George Foreman grill cleanable or kosherable? Um, the answer is no, um, because you'd have to use you have to get it to use, you know, you have to use like a blowtorch and get it to a very high heat, and that's going to ruin the uh, the George Foreman. So, uh, so you know, one is not able to cash that, but you can, um, if somehow you can get new, just grill tops, you know, grill plates, that would make it, you know, possible. I don't know if you could even do that, but uh, you could buy one specifically for uh, for Pesach, or again, get a hibachi grill, and you could use it. Uh, that's what you could use to grill. Uh, okay, Herbie, I, I've been told by someone here that there's a lot of Kashula Pesach toothpaste. So you'll have many different flavors and options. Jake, some like the, you know, uh, bubblegum flavor, some like mint. There are different options if you want to, you know, go crazy and have different uh, toothpaste for this, uh, this Pesach. Okay, any other questions that anybody has, feel free to reach out. Uh, thank you for participating. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to study with you. I want to wish everybody here Chag Kasher Sameach. Okay, it should be a beautiful Chag, a Chag filled with a sense of redemption, of Geula. Bezrat Hashem, we should be able to be with our family and friends, uh, and we should really make the most of this uh, the Seder. I want you to remember last year when uh, some people were just in with their nuclear families or, you know, with nuclear families, uh, just with their kids or even had to be by themselves or with, uh, you know, with their, uh, just their spouse, whatever it is. Uh, or their, their neighbor next door, I want to say two things. Number one, we should be so thankful that uh, we could be with a few more people at our Seder Pesach this year, number one. And number two, don't forget about what you learned last Pesach, that there is something special about spending the time with close family members. And there's even something powerful about sitting at the Seder alone and going through the Seder Pesach. And uh, so let's not forget the best. Let's take last Pesach with us into this Pesach and appreciate it uh, even more. So uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. And this Shabbat, okay, Shabbat Hagadol, we're going to have the Shabbat Hagadol Drasha at 5, uh, 5 p.m. around Shabbat afternoon. I hope all of you can make it for us to study together. So uh, wishing you Chag Kasher V'Samech and reach out if you have any more uh, questions. Kol Tov Erev Tov L'Kula, Erev Tov. Okay, Erev Tov, Erev Tov. Okay, okay, you're welcome, Eva. Okay, Erev Tov.